Sarai's machine learning has been here and there, but it's not a single chapter about machine learning in itself. But uh, machine learning is, is a fundamental part, part in many different aspects, and a part of uh, biomatics since well, almost since the start, since the mid-90s, so it's 20 years. Uh, and uh, it also has been a very rapid development the last few years, last almost well, well, the last two or three years, but started maybe ten years ago. So there, there are a lot of uh, uh, so it's, it's important to have some knowledge about it. But of course, it's, it's impossible to cover machine learning in one lecture and, and one lab. So it's really just an introductory part of it. And uh, so I gave you two parts to read. And the first one is starting basically the first lecture aimed mainly at more informatics students at Stanford. The first part of it uh, that sort of assumes that you know some of math and some things about matrices and so on and some idea of machine learning is. And the second part to so that so did you read that, no? What do you think? Too few yields and too many formulas? I don't think it was a single year. But anyway, it, 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 I agree, it, it's not the best, but it was one of the better things you could find really, that it gives some of the ideas. At least it, I, I will try to follow sort of the concept here, hopefully it clarifies a bit. The second one is that it's basically more of a, a much more aimed for biologists and mathematicians and people that really don't know so much about machine learning. It's not particularly from narrow networks, but it, in general, tells you about uh, uh, what you should think about if you start a machine learning project. And the thing is, I like, thought a machine learning project is actually not that hard. Because now there are computational tools that are around that are really good and easy to use. So it's not, you, you can, <coughs> in many aspects, treat the machine learning methods as a black box. However, the problem is that if you do that, you really mm, might do a number of mistakes. So, so my main goal of this lecture is lab is that you will learn some of your idea of machine learning is. And, and secondly, that at least you have an idea to be able to evaluate if things are done properly enough. So avoiding some of the task pitfalls and the measure how good the method is, etc. So machine learning, what is that? What, what, is, it, what is it to learn something? And what is different from that compared to <coughs> statistics or compared to normal programming or computation? So the idea is really in the word learning. So you have it, it's often it is actually quite related to statistics. You want to basically statistics also. I mean, if you want to predict uh, the weather of tomorrow, you can take uh, probabilities or measure the weather of January 31st in the last hundred years. You can guess that. On average, it's 25% chance there'll be snow and 50% chance there'll be cloudy, etc. That's statistics. That's nothing learning. But that's, so you, you have a lot of statistical things, and it, it, it's a relationship. But the key thing here is that you really do not tell the computer what to do. You just try to provide some kind of examples and then let the computer learn by itself. So that's basically uh, how. The idea is how a human or an animal learn. We don't tell a small baby how to walk. It's not move your muscle like that, like that, that. We sort of give them examples. We give them a candy whenever they walk. And, uh, and if you fall down, we say, go up again, go up. So we, 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 we learn. So the idea is that you learn. And uh, the whole idea started some kind of activity like quite a long time ago, probably in the 70s or something like that. But it's the idea is really that you should have the machine to figure out how to do things in itself. And there are a lot of subgroups, a lot of different methods. Today, given the last few years, we are back to basically the same method as one of the original ones using neural networks. That's almost exclusively the method used today. I mean, not, not only, but it really are taken um, a huge improvement the last few years, and then one of the first methods, but in between a lot of other methods. So we, we will focus on what's called neural, neural networks. So if you just, uh, what you see here, 
if you look at machine learning and BiPMED or in PubMed, you can see the number of papers here and then the creep of that. So it's really quite common. 26,000 uh, papers in PubMed for machine learning. So it's really used in many ways, worldwide, different fields of medical. And anything from diagnosis of diseases to protein structure prediction to classification of uh, uh, mutation, etc. Et it's all over. And part of it. And it was, of course, not only in mathematics, of course, it's used for when you look at Netflix to recommend you the next movie. It's, more, it's used for uh, well, YouTube, everywhere. It's part of the life today. And it will probably most likely be a much, much bigger part of life uh, for all of us in the next decade or so. So there, it, it, it's quite clear that many skills today. Computers can be much better at that than we are. Like it's if you're, uh, we are probably better at maybe love and caring, but we're certainly not better at doing a diagnosis. Even if we are, I mean, maybe if you take the best doctor in the world, he might be better. But most of us will not see the best doctor. We see some average doctor. And I'm, I'm pretty sure that within a few years, and a simple computer program will be much better than that. So what do we do? So this is from the book actually. So the idea is often. I will take a number of inputs. So in this case, it was actually to predict uh, genes. So if a part of the protein or part of the genome is a gene or not. Mm -hmm. This is what we talked about uh, last week. Uh, and uh, then you can take a number of measures. That you then turn into some type of numbers. And then you do some type of mathematical transformation is numbers basically you have to you have to multiply them with something with some weights or, you know, or put them into function so normal mathematics and you take it from all these and you combine them so you have a lot of weights here and you can manage it here and then you get a number which is on prediction result gene or not gene in this case often it's it, 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 uh, prediction result is just yes or no or something related it cannot be a number but basically a lot of inputs to one output and many, many different weights in between. And a complicated relationship between these weights. <coughs> and so what, you, what the whole idea is here basically that you, given these inputs and these outputs, you have sets of outputs often <coughs> that you know the answer. You know that this is a gene or so you, you tell the machine this should be a gene, this is not a gene. And these are the inputs. But that's all you tell it. You don't tell it how to figure out what is yours. And then you use some optimization methods to find the optimal weight for these genes, these, these inputs to provide this output here. So if it should be high GC in the gene, you have a high weight here that provides a high weight here. But because there are so many weights here, the combination can be very, very complicated. And nowadays, this is an extremely simple network. Now I'm sure you at the end, some of the modern type of networks there. Many, many layers, and there are different ways in the world. There, there are a number of variables, are millions of them. But the idea is really that we should not decide this by ourselves, we should let the machine figure out this, to basically optimize this, this weight. But we have often to provide the general architecture of this kind of network. So we have to provide how many nodes we have and how many how they are connected. So you said that, uh, like the genes, like we can get a yes or no answer, but we cannot get like on what basis it is there. You can, not, not directly, but there are of course some tricks you can figure something out. You can, for instance, provide artificial data to it to see what how the results of that. So there are, there are, you can get some kind of clues, but it's not obvious that you can get uh, exactly the rules. There, there are some methods that you get some indication of, but it's not. But exact, exact mathematics are exact numbers. Why did this happen or not? It's a bit hard to say. So for me, there's a famous recent example mm -hmm. when Amazon tried to screen uh, CVs. So basically, they screened for um, finding a good candidate for positions and for jobs. 
So they took the CVs and run and, and, and they trained it. So like, these are the good, good people we hired. So they trained it on these good people. And they say, we want to find CVs that sort of are similar as these good people. The problem also, they just end up getting males to see this, all the females. So anything that, and it, although they had they didn't put in the, the gender into the CV, they had things like if you were a um, stay member of the female basketball club, you, the computer could figure it out. So they really get many, many males on it. Try to fix it, they try to, because it's, of course, the reason, of course, all the examples they had were basically mainly men. So, so then basically the machine learned that of course. And they, but they end, so they try to fix it, they try to like take away things, and try to bias in different ways. But at the end they basically gave up. They said this is not even a way, let's use some other methods to screen. <laughs> so they are they, they couldn't figure exactly what it was, but it because there's so many small things. There may be uh, I mean, just like things you write that are sort of indicated, even maybe word order or whatever. That that work that so they they get they give up. So, what is an artificial neural network? So the idea, as you hear from the name, comes from a neural network. So that uh, I guess some of you at least have some idea of new neurons. So this is a neuron in a cell, and the idea is very much similar to that. So the basically, the basic concept of a neuron is it's more complicated. It's basically that you have some kind of nucleus, and this one has are connected to other neurons. So there are some kind of connections here. If on the dendrites. And you have a cell body here. And then given this some set of these impulses, you get an electrical signal that are then moved along the axon and then does some chemical release or something at the end. So this is how I mean, if I uh, hit my foot on the table, that's how the pain goes from, uh, or it feels uh, from the receptors down in the uh, in my foot up to my brain. But my one or two neurons. So these axons are long and they can be fast. But, but really, with the system of a brain or a neural circuit, we have millions of these connected to each other. Exactly how they're regulated and things. But the idea is the same that, that we have a lot of inputs. That provides sort of a signal that's basically yes or no, and then it provides some outputs that are connected to other neurons. So an artificial neural network is something like that instead. You have a lot of inputs, so this is one node in the neural network. We call it the cell body or the dendrite the inputs, the inputs here. And then we provide an output. And here we do some type of mathematics. So it can be uh, basically, we have take these inputs, this is a number, multiplied by some weight, different in each case, and maybe we sum up this weight together, and we add some constant or something like that, or uh, put in, in this into a function, and we give an output that is dependent on this function. Often, it should be yes or no, or some, some linear function that. We'll come back to that in a second. So, this is Mathematically quite similar to what we believe neuron is. And neuron are more complicated because there are time lapses, that there are signals that are come on, etc. But, but it's from a mathematical point of view, might it's okay, okay, approximation. So basically, if you uh, uh, look at it mathematically, the signal output is just uh, some vector w times another vector, or a matrix uh, vector uh, uh, w, and then input vector x. That's, a, that's an output vector, yeah. So basically, it's a matrix, it can be just a matrix multiplication. It can be more complicated function, but the simplest one is just a matrix multiplication. And you can have, uh, if you have two layers, you can basically say, yes, the, 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 output, the output is the vector 1 times the input vector, and then you have some maybe max function, function here, and then just multiply by another matrix. W2. The good, and uh, you have three layers, and you get more of these. The good thing is that this is actually things that computers are really good at doing. This is just basically matrix multiplications. And particularly now, what happened, in re one reason why things are suddenly much, much better with neural networks in the world only a few years ago is that this is what 
the graphics cards on your computer do? They do that because they are made for making games, to make you to calculate the, the shading of an object. Those just make some applications. They're not very good at making, if I do this, I should do that. This type of statement. But if they really want to just multiply things by each other, that's what the graphics card do. You can do it much more efficiently than if you have a general purpose computer that can really do everything. So this is quite easy for a computer to do. And, can, and these things have been much, much faster in the last few years. So a lot of this type of thing we do today, we, we go out and buy a fancy graphics card for a few thousand kroner, more than 10,000 kroner maybe, and we let it do the calculations instead of playing games. So that's basically why, mm -hmm. what, what we have to do all the time. So that's, mathematically it's not that complicated, and, and once you know these weights in a function, and you need to decide what function you have here to come that second. And basically, you also have the concept here you have sort of an input layer, some type of hidden layers. In this case, it's well, feel for an expert with everything starting here going up here. Nowadays, you have also the connections between them like that also. You also have connections like that the convolution network. network. We will not talk so much about it today, but modern networks and just hinder that are more complicated and also have more hidden layers. So, but basically, this sums up the function. Let's come back to this function. Um, in a second. Uh, yeah, so, this is just the same thing again. And you can basically write a small computer program that's basically the sum of this. It doesn't have to be, for calculating this, it doesn't have to be very complicated for when you basically have the sum, sum the inputs times the weight times the some bias. And they have, uh, you have, have a mathematical expression with the sigma minus some number, and, this, and then you just have a pirate. So basically, actually, the comp code is not, does not have to be very, very complicated. But it's just if you want to net it in a better time. Okay. So this function here. The easiest function you can think of, which is actually one, another reason why things have improved for a lot recently. So basically, what you, that means it decide, decides when or what output is given some type of input. The input is some, some or some weight. And if you think about it, the real neuron, you will often have something that looks, and this is the input, this is the sum of the inputs, some weights. You often have something that looks like that. And if it goes over a certain threshold, if you have enough stimuli, if enough light comes to your retina, you get a signal. If you have enough pain, you will use a signal. Uh, this is a bit hard to optimize because it, you can't you, you can't get the derivative of it. Because in optimization procedure, you basically need to find all this weight, and then you need to basically have a large scale of optimization. You need to have a derivative to find it. So for many years, people actually use some kind of moidal function that looks at that. Uh, or uh, a tangent, tangent function that looks a bit similar, basically. Well, again, basically the only difference is that for a tangent function that goes like, like, again, it goes like that, so minus, one, minus one plus one. This one has a problem. It's a, well, it was used many times, it was used standard. The problem here is that Basically, the derivatives are zero here and here. So if you're far away from optimal value, or from whatever happens, it doesn't matter what weight you set. You can you can go cut off the shape. It doesn't matter because you have zero. You can find the right weight because the derivatives are very low down here and up here. There are some methods where you can actually normalize the things to become better. So that's what one of the tricks. Another method that people use is to use this uh, what's called the relative function, which is basically a function that is like that. That is linear. That is uh, basically at some cutoff, it's zero. And that's basically it's quite linear, nice derivative of this area. This is the maximum. So as long as you are in this area here, which can make quite long, you have a good derivative. <laughs> so there's some tricks here to do, but in principle, it's the same thing. 
Uh, we can, if we do the demonstrations at the left there, we can try different things, yes? So, the derivatives are our output function? Or what no, is the derivatives are not the outputs. The, 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 the output doesn't matter. It's a, when we want to find the weights. Let's go to weights. Yeah, so when we want to find the weights, we basically do a search of all these states of all these millions of weights. And for those that we want to say, okay, we want to change the weights a little bit, we basically want to fall down to have a better performance, have less errors. And then, of course, it, it means like any optimization, if you think you might have, like you know, the dimensions, you want to find the minima here in an optimization function down here, you need, if you're here, you need to have the derivatives here. If you have a function that looks like that, you, you will never find this hole, because you basically start here. If you also have something that looks, well, it's not very well made, but if you have something that looks like that, you can start wherever and you have to take steps and you don't later end up here. But if something looks like that, like that or something that looks like this, you will have very hard time to find this one. So that's, you would have a smooth, nice solution. So it's, it's like any other optimization you do. So they, they, these are things that people have to learn, and tricks that you learn, that some of these functions work better than others. And the rally was, I think, 2008, 2009, was, was invented, so it's quite recent. And we, so this is like the paper, so this is actually, uh, they compare the, in this paper, they compare the sigmoid function and the, and the value function uh, for some problem, and this is the error, so and the, how many mistakes you make. And you see, and this is how many epoch, how many iterations you optimize your, your data on. So in this case, you can see here that in five iterations with the relevant function, you would get the same performance as you get with 35 iterations on using the sigmoid function. This is just one example, and it sort of depends on other facts also. But there are clearly something that you can play around with. <coughs> But what is normally, what you, so normally what you need to do if you know a neural network, network is, I mean, you need to create data, but one thing is exit architecture. <laughs> and the more complicated architecture you have, of course, the more complicated functions you can represent. You can show that I think that any mathematical function can, in theory, be represented by two layers in the network. You can basically, any function exists. You can prove it mathematically. It doesn't mean that you can find it, but it, it means that it's possible to be represented. I think actually maybe we have to slide on it. But the problem is, of course, the more parameters you have, the more weights you have, it's harder to find optimal ones. But the object we're talking about is, in most of the things I talk about today, except the last few slides, we talk about an input layer, one or several hidden layers, and an output layer. It can be one output or several outputs. You can bring several things in parallel. And it can be, and uh, it can be optimized for both of them. You need to, often you think it only has to be one, but it doesn't have to be one, it can be several. Mm. Yeah, so basically, in most cases, if I talk about, we don't have this type of architecture where things are connected back and forth, and they only go one direction in the feedback network. But nowadays, this type of method, or, Similar architecture are much more common. So there are really are advantages of using them, particularly things that transform up and down. But uh, that's we skip it through. So this is just basically the fixed function. You have your function here, um, like you have some input. You have a dot, basically your dot product of a vector and a uh, matrix, and then you have a second layer hit, uh, and output. Basically, you need these three matrices, is all you need. This is the input vector of the numbers. And you need some, and then you need to optimize them. These are the learnable parameters. Ah, yeah, the cut off there. You need to optimize. So you can explain a bit more what's happening here. So here, you basically want to, this is basically a function, and uh, this is just some random inputs. So that might be a bit but we can say external this is input. I do a matrix multiplication of this. So I, that means I get. Uh, Another vector. So that's basically <coughs> back one step for two steps. So this is a, this is a vector. Mm -hmm. This is one zero zero. 
I will do an example of a very simple vector to lay it in there. So this is a vector, A must have, and this is a, this is a matrix. Here you have a matrix multiplication matrix A, these three vectors, and multiply them. And the dot product is just uh, some kind of weight, and this is a matrix there, and you then get an output. And then in this case you have a second layer then, basically get these outputs here and do another another transformation again. That's the first layer, the second layer, and the outer layer. The outer layer itself is basically a space in the layer for I get out. So basically, you have three sets of matrices that you <coughs> optimize. What is the uh, The dot. It's a dot product, basically. You take, yeah, you have to get one number out of it, or a vector out of it, basically. And the trick what you do. This is basically how do you train this? What you do is you do, this is the input and you get an output. So this is look at one node. And then basically you say, that's why you need to have derivatives, because you want to know what this function should be here, the vector in the last or the matrix here. That's why you need to have derivatives. So basically you have an error here. If it should have been a one and it was a zero, you have an error. And you had this many examples, and you said, should be okay, how much was this error? Is the derivative of the, the, the error here itself? And you can feed it back, and you can get a, a basically an error on these weights, so also then you can optimize the weights. Could you give an example, like, how, what exactly, like, an error, like, based on an equation or something? Yeah, basically, in, in the simplest error is you should have a one, and you get a zero, that's an error one, and then you basically, or, 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 or simply, it may be simple to have when you have, should have a number. So you say, say you should predict the quadratic function. So you predict 1.5 and it should be 1.4. Then you take, and then you, what, what is the d, given this, my position here in the middle, what is the error? Then it's 0.1. And then you can take that derivative and calculate it back. So the error is, often the error is just, uh, I mean, the sum of the differences, basically. Or it kind of adds some of the differences or something like that. So you can you can get the gradient, and then you mean you can you have a look at gradient this one that has two four components, and you can basically change it afterwards. Uh, here, here is the error function. This is in this case it can be just a sum of a half for the C is the, basically the cost is just. Uh, the uh, basically the sum of the predicted numbers minus well the, the predicted numbers you have minus the correct number you want to have and it square with the sum up. Yes? Can you define the what the gradients are? Because I don't really understand. So the gradients, I mean that's um, and basically what will happen, how will this output change if you make a mid, mid, uh, infinitely infinitesimally small change of one weight. So it's like, it's like the gradient in, the, in here. What is the gradient? Yeah, how much does this number here change if you do a small step of that section? So it's defined the same way as the gradient in the, in the thing. Well, it's very hard to do it in more than one dimension. Or if you think about the many dimensions, you get, there are thousands of dimensions, that's why it's quite difficult. So the back pa the backwards pass is basically just back propagation. That's just the word for it. Yes. Or well, the whole process is back propagation. Uh, the whole process. Uh, well, yeah. The back pass is probably what I would call. I probably would call. Well, the back propagation is basically the whole process of training. Yes. So you have the input. So you have some activation function here, something. And you calculate the number, you calculate what, what predictions will you get to give you the thing the function. You have an error, and you can calculate the derivative of this error. And then you can back propagate this error, basically how much of this error depends on this variable here. And then you have a, then you say, okay, uh, having to, for each weight, each of my meters of factor have some kind that this, uh, I mean, it should increase or decrease or it should change this much if I want to improve the error. So that, that basically you can get from a, from, from a function. But then we'll have a very local hit in this area here. 
and then I can change it in a small part of step it up with direction and then do it again. And the cost function, I, could you ex try to explain it again in different words? I didn't understand so that. the cost function is basically just if you take, I mean, the easiest would be if you, if you want to, you, you give examples, you, you have examples A, B, and C maybe, or you have some examples, and you know that this should be one, and it should be two, and it should be three, but maybe your prediction gives 1.2 and 2.1 and 2.9 and then you would have some error here be this is the this is the train data you would say this is the prediction and this is the error then it's just 0 0.2 0 0.1 0 0.1 so the sum of the error is maybe uh, 0 0.4 then or you maybe you want to take it square but it doesn't really matter <coughs> So basically, it's just a sum of the errors. How far away are you from absolutely perfect prediction what you want to do, what, what, what you want to train on? But also, of course, this is normally you have much more than three examples. So how, how far away are you from uh, the correct answer? So now I thought of doing this. So this is just. Um, we can think about it also from a bit of a, I guess that you're talking about profiles and secret searching and so on. Uh, so do you, do you talk about proof side the patterns? Or about patterns? So sometimes, particularly in early days of mathematics, people try to identify patterns. You have, you basically say that you have uh, uh, we have, some, we have some sequence here. Yeah, maybe, maybe. Well, I, put, I showed you something, I think. No, I haven't done that. I will show it later. So, for instance, the cleavage sites of uh, signal peptides. So, signal peptide is something I will talk about later. But it's a signal that tells you that a protein should go be exported out of the cell. So, that you say, if you have a, so if you take a signal peptide here, and then you look at the uh, Basically, you have some, it starts with the M terminal, and you have some hydrophobic region here, and then you have a cleavage site here. So, that, 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 uh, for this purpose, it's nothing matter, but it is basically where it, it's a protease that cleaves off, off it. it has to go through the membrane that cleaves off there. Uh, and position minus one and uh, minus three. Are almost exclusively arginines. So you could have a pattern that says something. You have, if you have an arginine and another amino acid arginine, that is a pattern that could recognize the cleavage site. This is just a logical function. So this is something people use for finding signals in proteins or in white DNA or in genes for many years. However, so you, use, you can use profiles, so the Martin models that I guess talked about. Did you talk about profiles? You know, I don't remember. So basically that the probability that you have an origin here and an origin there. But what, what this kind of profiles not can do is that assume that you would say we have another pattern, which would be arginine something and lysine, or lysine something arginine. But you do not want to have arginine, arginine or lysine, lysine. To say that these things are not good, but these things are good. This, this is, from a logical point of view, this is the XOR problem. So basically, input and output of an XOR problem is, you know, this is just from basic uh, uh, philosophy. You have, you have and and OR and XOR. So XOR is basically exclusively OR. So basically, if this is the A and this is B, and you want to have output, so we want to have 0, 1, 1, 0. If, if, if this was a, this is a, one of the fundamental parts of any philosophy. You have, you have M, you have OR, and you have XOR. 
So and means that you have then this one and this one means you have one here and everything else will be zero. And the or problem will be you have A or B. You have one all the way here. But X or is A exclusively or B. So you basically will have an output of this like that. And this is something you can, cannot, in a proof one, you can't represent it like that. Because you don't have any information saying that I want to have an origin here but not a license here. I want to have only, I want to have, well, if they are summing up the probability of both of them, they're not, they're not like, you don't have any long range information. So that's the way we do it. So in basic statistics, you can't do it like that. But with a narrow network, you can. And this is like basically the most simple narrow network you can learn. So I will sort of go through that. Not maybe how to learn it, but how, how it could look like. So, sorry. Yeah. <coughs> could you explain again the XOR? Is it, so it's zero because it's. Because then it's zero because it's both are one yeah. or both are zero. So it's exclusive door. It has, it, only one of them has to be one. So it's like, okay. assuming that it was already in license. So like you want to have one already in one license, but not two already, not two licenses. So then, and that's, uh, and you, you can think about it like some long range correlation and things or something, but, but it, or, um, yeah. So if you make a network that looks like this, we can, we can do it. basically we have two inputs. A and B, so they are A and B. And then we have these two hidden layers that you have connections to, and you have one output layer that gives an output. So we know then that we should have, basically we can take away this part here, we should have this. If A is one, this should give uh, a and B are one, which is zero, but if A, uh, if one of them are, are one, you should, you should have zero. And you can have a very, very simple function that basically are set here in, in nodes, in these nodes here. So these this are always going to be one or zero. This is input. And here you're going to have some simple function. So the simple function is basically okay, the sum of the inputs, so xi times some weight. No, actually, we don't even have, we don't even need any weight in this case. Uh, but basically, but it's a function that is the sum of the inputs minus some cutoff. And the function is so that if it's basically, if it's higher than zero, then you give a one, if it's less than zero, you give a, you give a zero. As an output, so basically some kind of threshold function or whatever. This is a function. And this is basically this is the cutoff. So now I claim, no, actually they have, uh, sorry, they have weights, I guess. Yes. Uh, yeah, there's the weight also, so yes, the weight. So basically, if I put the weights here on this, I have one. Uh, this is also 1.0. This is also 1.0. And uh, here I have the cutoffs. I have to see what this is minus one. We have to yeah, do some math there. Uh, this is minus two. Minus two point zero. And this cutoff is equal to mm, minus zero point five. And this one also. Uh, so let's do this. We have a different input. We have one, 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 zero, zero, one, and Zero, zero. So if I start with the uh, zero, zero. Uh, no, I start with one, one. It's okay. Uh, 
think this should be my, my number so I think we have to check. Uh, so here, if I have uh, these are ones, or the sum here up here will be two. The sum here will be two. Uh, the sum there will also be two. Because we have, we can write this, we can write this smaller. We have two here and the two here. Because they are weights of one all the way. So the output of this, so this is the input here. The output uh, it will be. Uh, if it's two, and take minus two, then it's basically zero, which I guess is to be the output of one, because it's cut off is one or higher, or so zero higher. And this is uh, cut off is 0.5, so also higher one, just shows you an output of one. And here, uh, we have one point zero there also. So, so basically here, you will get 1 times minus 1.5, meaning the input here will be minus 1.5 to this one, and plus 1 to this. The sum here will be, sum here will be, well, sorry, it will be basically minus 0.5. So, minus, minus 0.5, that means that the output here will be 0. Minus 1.5, minus 0.5 is the last one. If you take the next layer, the inputs of these two layers will be 1. Input of red, in both layers. It means the output of this one will be 0, because 1 minus 2 is less than 0. But the input of this will still be 1. Because 1 minus 0.5 is more than 1. And that means the sum here, I got the input, uh, so basically you multiply by my minus 1.5. And that means that you still have a 0 here and you have a 1 here still, and this is multiply by 1. Means the sum here is 0 0.5 minus 0 0.5, the sum is actually 1. And 1 minus 0.5 means that the output will be 1. The next layer, I basically have 0 and 1, so the output here will be the same. No difference. So of course everything else will also be the same. Because the, the 0 is the same, will be the same all the way, so you have 1 there also. And if here the output will be 0, the input will be 0, that means of course that the uh, Basically, you have uh, uh, this. These will be also be zeros because they're less than one. And then I have this will also be zero, but zero it means the sum is zero, and means I have the sum will be minus 0 0.5. Then it means that the output which is less than zero means the output will be zero. Can you maybe do it again for one one? Cycle not like for every number, but like really for, for starting. What what, I, what I'm doing per step for each step, just in principle. So in principle here, this one, this number here, that's just the sum of these two. Okay. Uh, not the time the weight. Okay, and the other ones are always. So this is just the, the the sum. Every here is just the sum. Or whatever you, all you got, you have a zero or one. Okay. And you multiply with the weight that stands here. Okay. So this is one way missing it. We want to see though. And then I have the cutoff. So basically, yeah, if you have one, one, you will have two. If you have one, zero, you will have one. And then I have a cutoff, or that is, a, a, or a subtractive value here. So if you have an input of two, and you subtract two, it could be 2.1, or something like that. Then I get less than zero. And then I have zero. And then, then I have this function here, what it tells you is that if the sum multiplied by Minus the, the sum minus the cutoff, or plus the cutoff, 
uh, is uh, less than zero, I give it zero, I give it more than zero, I give it one. So the function looks like that. So this is basically, okay. So that, that's a fine, yeah? So you said that the question was like, like uh, how like two minus two will be zero. So what happens after that? Two minus two. Uh, well, I, I said that well, it, should, it probably should be the correct. It should be one point ninety nine. That, that would be better. So two minus one point nine is point zero one. Because otherwise, it, oh, I don't know. What, my but if I one zero to be also one. I said it would be the same thing. And then, basically, if this is really, if I have 2 minus 1.9 here, yeah. that means that this output will be 1. And then I take 1 times minus 1.5, and the output here was also 1 in the first case. So here, here I will get a value of minus 1.5, here I will get a value of 1.0. So I sum this up, so minus 1. Minus 1.5 plus 1.0, and then I take this cutoff, which was minus 1.5, is uh, minus 1.0, and that is less than zero, so I will give an output of so this. Is, this means an output of uh, zero. So the fu function of minus 1.0 is equal to zero. Is the minus 1.5 the weight? Uh, this minus 1.5 is a weight, yes. So, so some, there are many ways to get these weights. And, some, and, and it, was, it doesn't tell you how to learn them. It just tells you that it's possible to do this. So this is not, this is really after the mathematical difference. But, it, but it's something that you can think about that, is, that you could learn complicated functions with well, quite a lot of many weights, I'm sure. You, and this is something you couldn't do with just, if you, if you didn't have this hidden layer, you couldn't do it. If you don't hit the layer, you, you can you just sum it up. There's no way you can get this one. Unless you have a more complicated function, of course, you can maybe, maybe you can get this. You can prove, actually, as I said, that the neural network can, can solve any function. And, uh, well, that's just, it, yeah, this is nothing you have to learn. This is just basically. The very, very overview this code. So basically, uh, the outputs here, you can see them sort of like threshold functions. You can sum up things here. This is basically similar to what I said before. And the x is up, well, just represent the rest of the but it's some kind of sum here, a number. So basically, if you have only one number, you can get any function. By here, you can, for instance, have two cutoffs and two weights, and uh, you can basically get this function. And if you just think about that, you have a uh, smaller weight, you can get this kind of function. And if you add more layers, you can get more complicated functions. And if you just keep on adding layers, basically, you can get any standard solution, you can get more functions. So if you have very, very many layers, you can basically get, with infinite data precision, you can get any function. Yeah. Can you show us how the diagram can plot into the graph? Right. So basically, here basically, if you have a one, here, I, mean, I don't know what, what x is, uh, if x is low, if x is zero, basically upper is zero, x is one, uh, you have a point 0.4 here, so point 0.4 times point, oh wait, if x is a half, I guess you have a, uh, they have a cutoff, my x is half, this one will be one, this one will be zero. Okay. So you will have, and so you will be one times 1.2. So the output will be uh, 1.2, I guess. No, sorry, this one will be, this one will be the other way around. This one times this one, 0 0.4 times 0.24. No, it will be 0 0.6, that's this number here. So between 0.4 and 0.6, this one will be zero, and this one will be one. So basically, you get this number here, 0.6. And if it's higher than, than, than uh, uh, 0.6, both will be one, so then it will be 1.8. This number here. This is the cutoff, and this is the weight. So if it, if it, if it, if it everything is zero, you get zero. 
if, if, now, if it's between 0.4 and 0.6, and the cutoff is, this one will be activated, and the output will be between this number here, 0.6. Because this, this, this output is just a sum of these numbers, and it's not like a function of I had over there, it's not a sum. And then if you make it like this, uh, and basically if it's more than, if it's between less than 0.4, it's still zero. If it's more than 0.4, but that's 0.6, it's this output. If it's more than 0.6, it's this output plus this output, which means that you basically have a function like that. You follow? And then, basically you can have here, so if it's less than 0.4, you're here. If it's between 0.4 and 0.6, you get this number, uh, minus 1 by 2. If it's more than 0.6, you get, uh, I guess, I guess it should be plus 1.2 there, you get up to this number again, and then between 0.7 and 0.9, you get this number. So basically, then this one cancels, and this is, this is only the value. So basically, then you can add this, you just add many of these, and get exactly what number you want to have every function. You need to have infinite the number of cutoffs. And for the right, for the right function now, it's like really, really much. Yeah, you, you, have, you need a post, whatever the solution you have, you need one the specific, well, you need two node tricks. No, I, I mean, the function on the right yeah. is like then like nearly infinity. Yeah. Infinity, yeah. But you can prove it with any solution you want, you have to add more things. I guess. I mean, it's not, it's not practical. In theory, you can do it. Uh, let's play with this in the third break, and we can go back and play with it a little bit of computer games. No. I think we should have time to finish anyway. Yeah. So let's take uh, 15 minutes. Temper, something? Mm -hmm. yeah.